Good evening again. I just want to, again, I hope everyone enjoyed the delicious food and the desserts. Um, if you haven't uh, tasted the desserts, you can take a dessert, a cup of coffee, and get ready for the lectures. Again, thank you to all those who um, brought, cooked, uh, provided the food for tonight, the delicious food that we, uh, we share together. Today I welcome Haik um, Keishan among uh, Keshishan. Keshishan. Um, Haik has been a, 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 the history teacher in our Armenian school. He's very knowledgeable on the Armenian history and the Armenian uh, matters and, the, and we wanted to invite him and also give him the opportunity to share his knowledge with us and uh, tonight we will we'll have a uh, some portion of his knowledge that he will share with us tonight about, about Armenia. Welcome, Haik. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Haik. Thank you for inviting me to speak. And I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Armenian School who are sponsoring this uh, event tonight. And I hope everybody has enjoyed the meals. And we're going to have, a, I hope, an interesting uh, few minutes as we look at a period in Armenian history which is probably a little obscure for many people. We are going to be looking at the times between um, St. Gregory the Illuminator and the establishment of Christianity in Armenia to the fall of our last Armenian kingdom. And we're going to be looking at our Armenian culture and the way in which ideas have been transmitted into Armenia but even more interestingly, how ideas that were established in Armenia radiated outward and affected cultures in Western Europe. And we're going to see that most clearly in one of our uh, most important contributions to Western culture, which is in architecture. So when we think about Armenia, <clears throat> We have a very rich heritage. Okay? This is something that we should never forget. And our contributions have influenced people throughout the world. And we're going to see how that's actually taken place. So if you think about the iconic features of Armenian architecture, you probably think about the following. Let's look at some of them. Everybody should recognize this cathedral. Uh, this is, of course, Etchmiadzin. And Etchmiadzin actually had to be rebuilt after the defeat of the Armenians in the Battle of Avarad. The Persians actually destroyed Etchmiadzin, the cathedral, and then it was rebuilt by Vahan Mamigonyan in 484 AD. This is the oldest continually used cathedral in the world. So we Armenians can be proud of two things. First, we're the first Christian nation. We always emphasize that in our Armenian school classes. But we also have the oldest cathedral that's in continuous operation, which is, of course, the seat of the Catholic Osei. So this is Etchmiadzin. And we're going to have a surprise a little bit later, where you're going to see that Etchmiadzin makes a reappearance in a rather unexpected location in Europe. I hope, oops, let's go back one. I skipped the punchline here. This is St. Hiripsime. This was um, perhaps one of the most important, and it's one of the oldest churches still standing in Armenia. Um, it was actually built on an old pagan temple. Uh, ex excavations that were done in the 1950s discovered the temple that had been uh, there at that location, and then an Armenian church was built by Gomidas Shinol, Gomidas the Builder. He was the Catholicos. We don't actually know who the architect was. But depending on who you talk to, this is one of the earliest examples of a form of architecture known as a Romanesque. And this is characterized by these tall arches that have these rounded tops, very narrow windows, very massive stone. And this can be found throughout Europe as well. So whether this came into Armenia from Europe or came to Europe from Armenia, uh, I can't give you the answer. But certainly, it was developing in this part of the world at a very early time, um, year 618. 
Now, culture can travel horizontally from one people to another, but it also can travel vertically through time. And I think one of the more interesting um, preservation of our culture can be seen on, in Midtown Manhattan today, which is, of course, the cathedral that we have, which is modeled quite closely on St. Hedipsima. You can see the same Romanesque arches with the rounded tops, the narrow windows, the massive stonework. So 1,300 years later, we have maintained an architectural style on 34th Street and 2nd Avenue. Now, perhaps the most important monument from Middle Ages in Armenia is the Great Mother Cathedral of Ani. And unfortunately, this is only a few miles over the border from the river in Turkey. It's in ruins. And um, this one building actually incorporates within itself a sort of a most amazing uh, example of what we might have as the earliest developments of the Gothic architecture. Unfortunately, the uh, tower has collapsed, the roof is falling apart, the Turkish government is not doing very much to maintain any of these um, monuments, and um, we're going to learn a lot more about the man who actually designed this building. This was Dirtad, the architect, Dirtad Jardarabed, who will actually make some very interesting reappearances in history. Um, and if you've ever been to Istanbul, you will probably recognize his greatest creation there. So let's look at the history, a little bit of the background. So Armenia at the dawn of the Middle Ages. Well, after the fall of the Roman Empire, learning was sort of eclipsed in Europe. The schools were no longer operating. Uh, people were becoming more and more illiterate. Uh, many of the technologies that had been established during the Roman period had been forgotten. And even the basic ideas of building, for example, a cathedral had been largely lost. And these people would have to turn to other sources to get the information and knowledge to do what they might want to do if they were going to build something monumental. The principal problem was that this was a period of disorder. There was warfare, pillaging, and more destruction than creation. So Armenia, of course, was not um, immune to this. But in Armenia, remarkably, we were able to maintain some elements of our uh, learning. Uh, schools did not completely shut down. The monasteries were still functioning. Knowledge had not been completely lost. And Armenians had mastered one thing, which was, of course, a natural product of our environment, taking stone from the ground and turning it into something monumental. And it was this skill and this knowledge that became so valuable and then was transmitted into Europe. So, all of Western Europe was in disorder and finally reunited pretty much most of Western Europe under the um, monarchy of Charlemagne. Charlemagne united what is now Germany and France and parts of Italy. He certainly was the one emperor that had managed to reunite a large part of Western Europe. And The Pope, Pope Leo III, decided that this was an opportune time to re-establish the Roman Empire. And so on Christmas Day, in the year 800, in Rome, in the Basilica, the Pope crowned Charlemagne the Holy Roman Emperor. And according to that event, the Roman Empire was re-established in the West. Now, Charlemagne, of course, wanted to have something magnificent to accompany his now magnificent role as the emperor. And he wanted to build the greatest cathedral of his time. 
in his capital, which is Aachen. Now, the problem was there was no one there who knew how to do this. So he searched for the best architects that could help design and build this cathedral. And this is the great cathedral in Aachen. And the man who designed it and led its construction was an Armenian named Odo, Odo of Metz. We don't know very much about his biography. All we do know, though, is that he was Armenian. He must have incorporated the knowledge that came from Armenia in terms of building and architecture and building a church or a cathedral. And this is his creation. This is the famous Aachen um, Cathedral in Aachen, Germany. And this was built in 792 and designed by the, thank you, the Armenian architect Odo of Metz. Now, the gem, the thing that Odo built for Charlemagne, which is still one of the most magnificent uh, creations in Germany, is the Palatine Chapel in Aachen, which is shown here. And this is a chapel that um, Odo designed that has, of course, many Eastern motifs and features to it. But what's important about this is this is the location where the emperors of Germany, of the Holy Roman Empire, were crowned and consecrated. So the emperors of Germany, of the Holy Roman Empire, were being consecrated in a space that was designed by this Armenian who was providing his knowledge now to the German people. So Odo became famous. And he didn't forget that he's Armenian either. Armenians are like that. <laughs> so here we are in France, in the Loire Valley of France, and we're south of Paris, OK? And this is a small town called Germany des Prés. And in it, there is an oratory and a chapel that Odo built and designed. And this is what it looks like from the outside. Um, it's uh, finished in 806 AD. It's one of the oldest remaining churches in France. And inside it is a surprise that most of the tourists who come and see this church don't realize. But what Odo did is he took the floor plan and the designs of Echpianzi, and he transplanted them and put them in this church in the middle of France. So there's a bit of Echmianzi on the other side of the continent. And this is a view from the interior of the church. And this is the design that Odo had made. So our next story, we're still in the Middle Ages, but this is the story of the great city of Ani. And this is the story of a genius an architect named Dertad Jardarabed, Dertad the architect, and he will have an influence that will go far beyond Armenia. Those of you who have grown up in Constantinople, Istanbul, might recognize this structure. This is which building? Hagia Sophia. Sophia. This was rebuilt and redesigned by Dertad after he did most of the design of Ani. So let's look at his story. So this is Ashot III, the Merciful. The Bagaduni kings had colorful names. Um, the first one was Ashot I, the carnivore, the Sager. Probably not appropriate for Lent. <laughs> but Ashot III, the Merciful, managed to reestablish a large part of what is now historic Armenia under his kingship. And he decided to move the capital of Armenia from the historic location, Divin, to a new place called Ani. And this is a, a statue, a sort of an imaginary statue of Ashur III, Ashur uh, Volgonats, Ashur the Merciful. I'm not quite sure why he is the merciful, but anyway, that is his epithet. 
So to make Ani more secure and beautiful, we needed to have builders and architects that could design and establish this as his new capital. And a young man named Dertat, Dertat was in his 20s probably at the time and engaged by the king. The king was impressed by him. First task was let's rebuild the walls. So this is a view of the walls as they currently stand of Ani. How many people have been to Ani here? You have, okay. It's so close to the Armenian border, but you know, unfortunately it's on the wrong side of the river. So here we are. The Catholicos also moved to Ani. So now every, all the leadership of Armenia is, is concentrating itself in this one city. And Dertad now is given the task of build the Catholicos safe for the Catholicos. You know, the Vahapar needs to have a magnificent place for him to stay in Ani. Dertad gets the job. And the most important task he was given is to build the Mother Cathedral. And this was completed in the year 1001. And as you can see, this is just a desolate plain. All the houses and the churches, 1001 churches, are gone and pillaged. But the cathedral still stands. It's a UNESCO um, site, World Heritage Site. It was established in 2016. Also, St. Ripsime is one that was in the 1990s that it was established as a historic and world heritage site. But let's look more closely at this building. This is what we think it looked like when it was fully constructed and not in ruins. And this is the design that we believe that um, Divtad had come up with. Beautiful stonework on the walls that are still existent. Um, it's just a magnificent structure. And this is where the architects, the historians, get excited. Because this is a couple hundred years before the great cathedrals in the West, in France, for instance, are being built. And here we have um, the arches and the columns in the interior of the church and a vaulted arch, which is the characteristic feature of the Gothic architecture. This is all the design of Dirtai. Here is probably the most famous Gothic cathedral. It nearly burned down a few years ago. This is uh, Notre Dame de Paris. And if we look at some of the features in these Armenian monuments, we can see the, what is prefiguring what's going to show up later in Western Europe. Where did the ideas come from? Well, this is the same time that we have the Crusades. People from France and Germany were coming into the East. They would see these things, bring the ideas back to their home countries. Here is the famous Reims Cathedral in France. Um, this is built in 1275. You can look at the columns here in the vaulting. Here is the same columns and vaulting in the Cathedral of Ani and Ruins, built over 275 years before. So somehow ideas that were being generated by architects within Armenia had somehow diffused to the West, were now embraced by the architects there and became a new motif for building. So this is what Ani looks like today, the walls. And there's more to Dirtat's story. So um, the queen, Ashok's queen, uh, Khosro Vanush, decided to build a um, monastery, Akhbat, which is in Lori in Armenia. It's one of the other monuments that Dirtad built during the Middle Ages. This is the view from the grounds. This is the church of Surp Nishan. And here's a view 
of the interior of the church designed by Doug Todd. Mm -hmm. So there's an amazing story about Doug Todd. So this is actually um, recorded by an Armenian historian named Stepanos of Daron, and this is one of pages from his manuscript. And this was written in the 11th century. And what he's describing is how talent, in this case, Dertad, could be used to actually do something magnificent in a different location. So in the year, was it 989, an earthquake struck in Turkey, in Constantinople, not an unusual event as we know from current events, and it destroyed a large part of the city, and it also destroyed a large part of Hagia Sophia, who was in ruins. <coughs> the dome had collapsed, it was in pieces. And this is what it looks like today with the minarets that were added later. But this is what Stepanos has to say about what happened. And I'll just read it to you because I think it's an amazing story. So even the cathedral, Hagia Sophia, was torn to pieces from top to bottom. On account of this, many skillful workers among the Greeks tried repeatedly to reconstruct it. The architect Dertat of the Armenians happened to be there in Constantinople, and he then presented a plan to the emperor. And with wise understanding, he prepared a model of how he would rebuild the cathedral. And he then began to undertake the construction so that when they had finished the reconstruction of Hagia Sophia, it was even more magnificent than it had been before. So he had sort of rescued the scene. So Ani, of course, was a magnificent city. We remember it as a city of 1,001 churches, the great cathedral, the Catholic Hussite, all of that was destroyed in a matter of a few years. And from the founding of Ani as the capital to its destruction, we're talking about less than 100 years. So what happened? Well, after Asher III passed, he was then succeeded by other kings, Sampat Kakit I, and the last king of the dynasty was Gakit II, and he only reigned for three years, and he was deposed in 1045 by trickery. So the emperor, the Byzant Byzantine emperor, offered a peace treaty to the Armenians, and Gakit came with his entourage to Constantinople to sign it. What did the emperor do? He threw him immediately in jail, and then forced him to sign an agreement to make Armenia now a subject state of the Byzantine Empire, giving up the kingship. So this is actually a contemporary drawing showing that Katik is submitting to Constantine Monomachus IX. Well, now Armenia no longer has an army, no longer has a king, it's in disorder, and of course, under these really miserable conditions, the worst of all possible things can happen. So the Seljuk Turks appear on the scene, led by their leader, Alp Arslan. He was a bloodthirsty killer. He defeated the Byzantines. He defeated what the Armenians could put up in defense. He um, captured Ani, and 50,000 Armenians were turned into slaves, and the city was destroyed. Well, the final blow was the Battle of Maniskert, when the Byzantine uh, armies were thoroughly defeated by the Turks in 1071, and the Armenians now were completely at the mercy of the Seljuk Turks. And this is a view in brown of the Seljuk Empire during this period. And you can see that there's a small region here called Giligia, which is not brown. Why? 
because the Armenians who had been in the east migrated en masse and established a new nation on the Mediterranean, Gilegia. So this is the story of our knights in shining armor from the Middle Ages. These are the Armenian knights. So this is Gilegia on the Mediterranean. So you can imagine the Armenians are moving from the sort of the icy mountains of Armenia to the warm waters of the Mediterranean. Not a bad move. That's where my ancestors came from. And um, this lasted for almost 300 years until it was finally defeated and destroyed by the Egyptians. But there's a lot that happened before that. In Giligia, the Armenians then built using their skill as architects and stonemasons and building with rock, some of the most magnificent uh, castles of that period. This is the fortress of Anamor, and this is built right on the Mediterranean here. Remember, now Armenia is, has a coastline, has to defend itself from attack from the sea. It's a, becoming a big trading uh, nation, and to protect themselves, they started building these magnificent castles. Castles were built on mountain passes to guard entry across the Taurus Mountains into Gilikia. This is Levonkla. This is the castle of the first king of Gilikia, Levon the first, Levon the Magnificent, Levon Araj Mezakords. And you can just imagine, you know, if you were trying to attack Armenia now, what it would be like to encounter a defensive structure like that. So even today, if you look at the Armenian coat of arms, we still remember Giligia as one of the four dynasties that are still presented on the coat of arms of the modern Armenian state. So this is the first king, Levon the first, Levon Mezakhorts. Levon the Magnificent, he received crowns from the Emperor of Germany, from France, from the Byzantine Emperor, and um, in a magnificent ceremony, he was then consecrated as the first of a new dynasty in a new nation that the Armenians had established on the Mediterranean. Here's another view of Anamor, and it's just a magnificent structure. But it wasn't the only one. This is Gorigos. This is actually an outcropping island. Um, and this was also, uh, had existed beforehand and was, and was uh, enlarged and built by Levon I. And here's a view of it from the sky. You can see Gorigos sitting here just as this bastion in the Mediterranean to guard the seaways coming into Armenia. So this was a period of great cultural awakening among the Armenians. The Catholicos moved to Giligia and settled there as well. These are beautiful illustrations that were done in uh, religious books and Bibles. This is from Toros Roslin, who's probably the most famous of the um, illuminators of that period. Does anyone recognize this story from the book of Daniel? The three boys put in the furnace. Shadrach, Migrach, and was it Abednego? Anyway. Um, anyway, so we're seeing an, a flowering of culture in that time. And this is also a period of increasing wealth. Um, this is a gold tram of level the first. It says, by the grace of God. Well, good things can't last. And this was a period of tremendous turmoil as the Islamic people were trying to now um, remove the Crusader states from that part of the world. Armenia, of course, was constantly being attacked 
and threatened. And the next king, Hetum I, and his queen, Zabel, this is their Tadam there, and you can see the King Hetum, and right on the right there is Zabel, decided that we needed to have better allies. So what did Hetum do? He went incognito across the entire width of Asia to Karakoram in Mongolia. And he established Hiligya, Armenia, as an ally of the Mongol Empire. So that's our connection to the Mongols. He actually had with him a portable altar on wheels, the idea being that you know if it's going to convert the Mongols to Christianity, they're going to need to have an altar as well that they can now transport across the steppes of Asia. Well, this is the Mongol Empire established by Genghis Khan, and on the far western edge of it, we have the Armenians in Giligya as their allies in the west. So here is Karakoram. And the Armenians then fought side by side with the Mongols against their common enemy, which were the Mamluks of Egypt. So, unfortunately, the power of the Mongolian Empire was beginning to recede as well. The enemies were the Mamluks who ruled Egypt. And they were as good horsemen and fighters as the Mongols. And they were sworn enemies of both the Armenians and the Mongols. And in 1260, it ended. The Mongols under Hulagu Khan experienced their first defeat in battle ever by the Mamluks. And Armenian knights in armor were fighting side by side with the Mongols. And unfortunately, they were defeated. From that point on, Things went downhill, um, and eventually the Mamluks in 1375 captured the last holdout in Armenia and took the Armenian king, Levon V, prisoner. He was a cousin, a distant relative of the king of France, who marriage, and the king of France then uh, ransomed him from Cairo and brought him to Paris. And he is now buried, well, actually, we don't know where his actual bones are, but the sarcophagus is in the cathedral of the Basilica of Saint-Denis, where the kings of France were. So that was the end of an independent Armenia in 1375. Now, I want to finish um, with one more example of an Armenian architect who made a substantial impact a little bit later than this time, but now among the Turks. And this was an Armenian named uh, Mimar Kovsak Sinan. He was from Kayseri. We know he's Armenian. He converts to Islam. He works for Suleiman the Magnificent. And he becomes the chief architect of the Ottoman Empire and the most golden period of their history. And let's look at some of the things that this Armenian architect contributed to the culture of the Ottoman Empire. So this is a portrait of Sinan. Um, he's shown here with a shovel, or maybe he's mixing some mortar. But we know he's Armenian for a number of reasons. And one thing that he did do was the um, Sultan decided, on a whim, I guess, to massacre all the Armenians of Kaiser. Okay, not an unusual event. Sinan begged the Sultan to spare the Armenians, his, his relatives, and the Sultan relented because he was such a wonderful builder and architect. So he and his students went forward and built some of the following monuments. And maybe you'll recognize some of these. This is Soleimaniye Mosque in Istanbul, designed by the Armenian Sinan. The interior is unbelievable. Um, just the 
magnificence of what has been created here. This is the uh, view of the um, mosque from the outside in Istanbul. This is the Shazade Mosque, another incredible interior um, and designed by Sina. This is the Shazade Mosque in Istanbul. He also designed the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem. And uh, this is a view of the Damascus Gate, the most magnificent gate in the walls of the old city. Now, he died, but he had students that he had trained who were equally famous because of their connection to him. And when the Shah Jahan in India wanted to build a mausoleum to honor his dead wife, he turned to these architects trained by Sinan, the Armenian. And they built probably the most recognizable building in the world, which is the Taj Mahal. So we can see a connection here. Not that this is built by an Armenian, but this was built by the students of Sinan. So let me just say in closing that we do have a really remarkable heritage. Our history, of course, is filled with all kinds of hardship and terrible things that have been done to the Armenians. But we should be proud of the things that we have donated to the rest of the world. And um, our history is filled with glorious creations um, that have graced world culture. So thank you very much. And some really funny story, not funny, but um, interesting. interesting stories about Hetum's travels. Because Armenia was in ruins. And he, he's coming from Giligia, which is now the homeland. He's going through a devastated